Jason Carter. I'm an Indigenous visual artist based in Canmore and Banff. I am a member of the Little River Cree Nation um, and a member and from uh, John Dor Prairie, uh, Little Red River Cree Nation. Long way of saying that. <laughs> How about, um, should you introduce the gallery a little bit? Yeah, of course. The Banff location is a small, lo small gallery. It's about 500 square feet in Banff. Uh, we opened it six years ago after opening um, the Carter Ryan Gallery in Canmore 13 years ago or something like that. Uh, so it's really a little satellite location of the Canmore Gallery where we where primarily work and that's where my studio is and everything like that. Yeah. How many pieces do you have here today, do you think? Um, well, you know, it's the beautiful thing about opening your own gallery is you're constantly chasing the walls, the gallery, what's in there, right? So how many pieces in here right now? I don't know, there's maybe there's 12 pieces and then I've got a whole bunch of smaller ones as well. Um, but it's, uh, that is the challenge and which is what I really appreciate about having my own gallery uh, with my partner, Bridget, is it forces me to constantly create work and push myself as an artist. Can you tell us about a few of the pieces here today? Uh, yeah, so right now we're primarily looking at uh, landscapes um, and a couple of solids. But so this is a, a new design that I'm very happy with. Uh, it's a uh, rundle with a soaring eagle off in the distance. I've been really playing with color, trying to explore um, different representations of, this, of, of the land um, while sticking within my style breaking it down to its bare, simplest form uh, while you can still tell what it is. Uh, so this one I'm very excited about. You got these transitions from your dark yellow into your light yellow, kind of golden rod, I like to call it, into the background. Um, and, uh, and then it just needed that one element with the soaring eagle off in the distance. Uh, and then this one is Old Man Mountain. I've had it for, it's funny, this is the oldest piece in here. Let's see, like 2014. So it's nine years old. And it's one of these pieces that for some reason, it just hasn't found a home. It just kind of, it'll go into the, into the storage and then it'll come out when I need to put something on the wall because a painting just sold. So hence the reason why Old Man Mountain is out here. Uh, and so it's really, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's so old, I've really, I've changed the way I do my blends and even the colors that I use, uh, it's all really changed a lot. And that's, again, going back to having my own gallery, my own space, forcing me to constantly create work uh, is I'm constantly pushing and growing as an artist, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, over here, I've got another uh, a, a sort of a flip side version of Rundle uh, as well. Um, now I've started incorporating these silver moons, uh, which I'm very excited about. This like bright, um, uh, it's called liquid mirror. So at nighttime, the light just picks it up. Uh, and it's like the, it's like it has its own light source, which is pretty cool. Oh, so it's like an actual moon, like the actual. Yeah, exactly. So it glows at nighttime. Totally. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, you know, playing with these same, uh, I like to try and break the image down to its simplest form. So, um, everybody can, everybody can, in my mind, a lot of people can paint realism, you know, it's like, that is, it's wonderful, fantastic, and it, you've got to be a phenomenal artist to do it. For me, however, I like to do it in such a way, I like to paint in such a way that you remember what the mountains are when you've left. So you've come to visit Canmore and Banff, and you're like, you know, you're driving home, your prairie's right in front of you, and you're like, oh man, wasn't that amazing? The, the mountains, the way they swept up, and, and the colors, and all of that. You're not thinking about each of the trees, you're thinking about the broad strokes. And so that's what I paint, is the broad strokes of one's memory. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and, so, right, and then right down here, I've got some uh, sculptures that I'm working on, or recently finished. Actually, this is the oldest uh, uh, sculpture I have in here, which is a, a, um, a howling wolf I did. Oh, geez, probably 12 years ago. So this is in my permanent collection. And I got a big bear around the corner that's in my permanent collection as well. Um, but... Uh, you know, a little bit of everything. So I carve uh, soapstone. Uh, this is uh, Canadian soapstone from the Okanagan, and that's from uh, the Northwest Territories. And this is an Indian fusion from India, and this is an Italian alabaster. So they come in from all over the place. I, I order my stone from a couple of sources in, uh, in Vancouver, and they bring it in from all over the world. So I'm like a kid in a candy store when I go and, and, pick, up, uh, and pick out all of my, my stone. It's pretty cool. I just got three tons of stone delivered. Very excited about that. Three yeah. tons? Yeah, three tons in all different colors and 
And because when I was there walking around, I'm like, I'll take that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. I, don't, I have no idea what any of it is now, because A, you don't really know until you do the final coat, the final co layer of oil on it, then it really brings out the natural color of the stone. Uh, so it's, that's what, the beauty of it. So if you were to ask me what the difference between the painting and the sculpting is, I was a sculptor before I was a painter. Uh, and um, I started carving, um, obviously first. And so what I love about carving is it's a constant um, creative investment. When I start the stone, this, the, get the stone up on the table, I have no idea what it's going to be. And then by the time I get to the end of it, it's changed and morphed and turned into whatever it is it's going to be. It's like removing all of the material around it to create this bear or wolf that was never there before, uh, which, is, which is so much so gratifying and satisfying to be able to go in and just creatively invest for four hours and there's a new piece. Whereas the, the paintings are very much all on the front end. So I get to design and create. I'm a graphic designer before I was a painter. So I design everything first and then I paint. So all of my creative is on the front end of painting. I design it, then I'm good to go, and then it's just the hard work of painting, right? So it's, it's, I, get, I get both that way. So I try and do both. In a perfect world, I would be carving for four hours in the afternoon and painting for four hours in the morning. Paint, carve, paint, carve, but it doesn't really work that way. Kind of fits and starts. Is there a difference, do you find, with carving all the different stones? Yeah, there's a big difference with the stone carving. So, um, you know, it's um, every single piece is unique. So sometimes there's deposits that are, you know, you'll be carving in one certain direction. All of a sudden there's this chunk of iron oxide in it that either is super hard or super soft. You know, it goes either way. Um, and so, and then there's like grain of the stone, just like wood, stone has grain. It depends on how it was deposited. There's some stone that I've worked that like kind of like all of these little layers. So you can carve it one way, but as soon as you hit it the other way, it just pops off like shale. So th those are hard to carve, but you get these beautiful semi-translucent stones like this alabaster. Um, so, you know, they're, each of them have their own unique and different properties. Um, the soapstone primarily though is my medium, soapstone and alabaster. Uh, and the soapstone is like, uh, it's just, it's like butter. It's so much fun carving, um, you know, and it's soft enough that that's not, I'm also a bit impa of an impatient guy. So if I have to put 30 hours into a sculpture, I'm never going to get it done. Three hours. You know, I would much rather hit it with an angle grinder and carve quickly and efficiently. So that's the beauty of soapstone. Based on the region you get the soapstone does, does that make a difference? Um, yeah, I think so. I think from what I, the research that I've done, soapstone is essentially talc, like talcum powder, uh, and that all of the deposits that are within, and talc is white, so all the deposits in the talc are what give the soapstone the specific colors from the region wherever it's from. So, yes, therefore, it absolutely affects how it works and how, you know, how it carves. Like the Canadian stone is so consistent. It's dense, and, uh, and then, like, it's... There's no cracks, there's no fissures, it's perfect. It's like, you, I get these beautiful blocks of it. Or at least I used to be able to, it's really hard to get now. Uh, and then as you come over here, um, I've got a couple of, uh, this is a piece of um, uh, um, Three Sisters in Canmore uh, with the mountain, uh, sorry, with the moon, uh, you know, playing with, again, that um, uh, thick black lines to separate color, um, to give it its form. Um, uh, and to also rest your eye in a way um, between the, the two colors, if that makes any sense. Um, and then this is a much larger piece that I've done, uh, which um, uh, I'm very excited about, even though you'd never find a polar bear at uh, Mount Burgess, but that's my artistic license, I'm allowed to do that. Uh, or large trees. It's kind of like all of these elements that I'm just like, you know what, I wanna see what this looks like. Uh, so. You know, I was very happy with how it turned out. Um, yeah. And then uh, down here are some hockey sticks that, I've, that I did, uh, painted um, specifically for, uh, I was commissioned by the uh, Hockey Canada for the IAAHF uh, uh, tournament in 2022 um, in Edmonton. So I painted 175 of these sticks. 
uh, and they were given, so like 75 of them, I think, were gifts to coaches and dignitaries and whatnot of it, and I think everybody that worked on it got one. Um, and then um, the player of the game, so two players from each game got a stick for being the best player of the game, per game. Uh, and so it was pretty cool to see all these, um, you know, phenomenally talented young hockey players, you know, at the pinnacle of their career, um, receiving one of my sticks at the end uh, with a piece of my artwork on it, which was pretty cool. That is yeah. cool. They're each unique too, eh? Yeah, well, they were all hand-painted, right? So I, they arrived with this on it, uh, and then I cleaned it all up and painted each individual one of them, yeah. Um, you know, in hindsight, I may have not have put all of the little teeth on it because you've got these little tiny chicklicks you have you gotta paint while you're, you know, tiny little things and you got 175 of them. It's like, what have I done to myself? Uh, but, uh, but yeah. That must have been super exciting though to be working on it. It was, yeah. It took a long time to figure out how to do it. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, <clears throat> the response was amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, um, yo, yeah, my God, the, it was pretty cool because the CBC did a, um, um, they do a moment at the end of each national. And I was the moment for that, that day. It was pretty cool. And what was awesome is that in that moment, um, the person who was hosting that day happened to be an old colleague that I used to work with in a channel in Edmonton years and years and years ago. So it was pretty cool. Full circle to have an old coworker doing this story about my artwork, you know, 25 odd years later. Wow. That is cool too. Yeah. <laughs> was it hard to actually paint the stick? Um, yeah, it was in the sense that, uh, um, yeah, it, had, it was a lot of work because they didn't, they, they didn't come bare. So it was just a lot of prep work actually. So like, so that when I, so the thing about painting on anything beyond canvas is you got to prep the, prep the substrate so that glue doesn't come out. So if I just painted directly on this, all of the white would turn yellow because the glue comes back out of the, out of the wood because it's built in these layers and then glued together. So if you don't prep the stick or prep the substrate, then that glue will come out and discolor the painting. So the, the biggest part of, the, of it was literally sanding and clear coating every single one before I started painting it. Awesome. That was, the, that was the, the most work. 175 times. Yeah. yeah. Holy smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and then painting them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of work. That's crazy. How long did this piece take to paint? Um, well, you know, I, it's hard, that's a hard question to ask because my process is very, um, is very um, specific in the sense that I work on multiple pieces at the same time. So if we were in my studio right now, every single one of these pieces on the wall would be on the ground, on the floor, ready to go. And I work my way. So I would put a layer of blue on this and then move to the next one, put a layer of blue on that, move to the next one, put a layer of blue on that. And I work all the way around like that. So I don't have to wait for paint to dry. Otherwise I'm in there standing around waiting for paint to dry. You weren't kidding about the, the, the impatience of like the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and it's, it's that's again, the, the, you know, back to what I was saying about, about uh, having one's own space. Um, it, uh, it enables us to really explore and flex creatively. So in Canmore as well, we've just opened a little um, uh, uh, 50, seat, 50 to 75 seat theater in Canmore, right in the middle of the gallery, uh, which we're very excited about because now it's an opportunity for my partner, Bridget, to explore her creative um, avenue of theater, which is that's, that's her background. Uh, and then for me to step in and also play with that as well and by doing set design and, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So it's pretty exciting. Oh, that must be really Having fun. your own space, yeah. That's cool. So you'll just work on a whole bunch of different pieces at this. That's yeah. Do you find that like, your, oh, I guess you pre-make all your stuff, so it would. Which is what I mean, yeah. So with the painting, I've already designed them. I've, I've, I've put all the creative in already. So now I'm just going around like, okay, right, I've got a, my horizon line is here, so I gotta do that. It's very technical after I've finished the design. It's just making sure that my horizon line is in the right place. I need to think, I'm like, okay, well, the mountains are gonna come up here, so I've gotta save room for the moon and that kind of thing. What's the most pieces you've ever worked on at once? The most pieces I ever worked on at the same time would have been for the Calgary International Airport. 
So they commissioned me to do uh, not 20 giant paintings that are all up at the Calgary International Airport. So when you arrive at arrivals, so 13, no, 15 of them were individual pieces. And then uh, four of them were multi-panel paintings where it's two, like two of these side by side makes one image. And another one, there was 13 of them that were you know, a little smaller than this all the way across to make one image. So it was a, a huge amount of paintings. I think all together there was about 30 canvases at the same time. Um, and that was when my studio was in Edmonton. So I was able to do that, a much bigger studio space there. Why do you piece it at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that ever get like overwhelming? Absolutely. Yeah, it definitely gets overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, it's just about taking breaks and mental health checks and yeah, totally. Now, do you prefer the big paintings? Or when you're painting or like the, the smaller ones here? Uh, I definitely prefer the big ones. Yeah, they're more fun to do. Uh, and um, the, the scope of them, you know, being able, to, being able to play in that amount, that kind of scale um, with these broad color planes uh, for me is pretty exciting. So I like doing commission work and, uh, and uh, 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 corporate offices and stuff like that because it's like I'm working on a giant piece right now of Longview, Alberta with the prairies into the mountains uh, and it is, oh, how many, it's four, it's a four panel series that each of them are, are they 80 inches each? So 80 times four, what is that? 16, 320 inches. So it's 320 inches by 72 inches. So it's a huge painting. I'm so excited about it. It's going to be so much fun. Holy cow. Yeah. Is there a piece you've had the most fun on or pieces you've had the most fun um, on? You know, that's a good question. Um, and uh, yes and no. So the most fun I've had is the piece I just finished. And that's the beauty of what it is uh, about, about, for me as, a, as an artist, it's a constant creative investment. So I'm always pushing myself. I'm always trying to do better and grow. So I just finished the little sitting bear behind you in Alabaster. I love the way he turned out. So he's my favorite right now. You know, that being said, there are a few pieces that I've kept for myself, like the wolf or the, or the big walking bear around this thing here. And I've got a couple of paintings that I've kept for myself. Um, but really it comes down to, um, you know, loving, loving my job in that um, everything that I do is my favorite. So you, you do have a hard time letting go of some pieces then? I do. Yeah, there are um, uh, some pieces that I have a hard time letting go of, uh, like a little turning rabbit that I just recently capped. And there's a, I've got a bear, that, the first design of a bear, like standing here and looking over the edge of the, which I don't have here. It's uh, at home because I kept it. Uh, you know, so there are a few pieces, but on the flip side of that, if I sell that piece and it finds a home, then I get to carve another one right? Or I get to paint another one. So that's where I, that's how one needs to approach it for me anyways. I need to be able to say, I love that piece. It's amazing. I'm, it's like my favorite. And then when it goes, I've got to be able to let it go and move on to the next one. So it's a bit of a challenge. It took a long time for me to wrap my head around it. Have you ever made a piece twice before, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, it does. So, you know, that's just it. There's only so many mountains, I guess one could say, or landscapes, you know, I, uh, Mount Burgess or Three Sisters is a common theme in my work or um, Rundle. Uh, so yes and no, I do paint the same uh, um, landscapes, uh, but because they're all individually done by hand, um, I've always changed them a little bit, you know, so uh, they're, everyone is different and unique because I've hand painted it. Uh, and, and then, as I said, I'm always pushing myself to try and grow, you know, which is where the piece behind you of Rundle came from as well. I'm like, well, I painted Rundle in that perspective. I'm going to do it from a different perspective right there. So, you know, and then I've just done another one from Vermilion Lakes where you've got Sulphur Mountain in the foreground and then, and then uh, Rundle in the background. So consistently, I, as I was saying, trying to push myself and grow as an artist while at the same time not doing the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. So how... Is it then to compare you know, your newer works to the ones you've had for quite some time? 
Well, it's interesting. It's um, one of those things where it's a, a, a visual representation of my artistic growth. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool. So what do you think Jason in 2014, who was painting that piece there, would say if you were seeing the, the pieces you got over here? Uh, he'd be it? like, damn, that was good. <laughs> That's what he would say. Yeah, uh, because for me, like, for, so when I'm standing here, I'm looking at that one, I can see, I can see the brush strokes in the sky there, you know, and me now, I just like, I end up putting hours into these things to try and make them look seamless. So it's, it's that um, there's a, um, a phenomenal Canadian author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell, and he wrote this great book called um, Outliers, and in it, or was it Outliers or, yeah, anyways, Outliers, um, and in it, he, he um, uh, spoke about this 10,000 hours where to become, a, a, you know, really good at anything, one needs to put 10,000 hours into it. If you want to play the piano, you need to put 10,000 hours in. You want to play the violin, you need to put 10,000 hours in. You want to be a visual artist, you need to put 10,000 hours in. And so that 10 years ago painting over there, I've had the fortune of putting 10,000 hours into my work since then, which is why I feel like I can say that's, a, you know, a lifetime of investing into one thing consistently and um, pushing myself. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I remember that. I heard that a lot growing up. <laughs> yeah. Malcolm, it was, it was either it was outliers or it was tipping point. It was one of those, I can't remember exactly which book it was. It was probably Outliers because it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a bit of an audiobook fiend as well. So while I'm painting, um, because as I said, I've put all the creative on the front end of it. So while I'm painting, I listen to audiobooks and I'll just pound through audiobooks. So I listen to ev I've listened to every single one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. I've listened to, you know, name a, name a detective series. I've listened to it. You know, like I'm right now, and I've listened, now I'm listening to like these fantasy novels randomly, which I'm not a fantasy guy, but now I'm like, well, maybe I am. So <laughs> listening to all these novels. There was a little while where I was listening to um, over and over and over again, trying to teach myself astrophysics, uh, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking. So he wrote this book called A Brief History of Time, uh, and it's heady. I bought it, listened to it, and I was like, this is, like, I don't know what the heck this guy's going on about. Didn't understand it, and so I, you know, I, and then somehow I discovered there he did. They did a second release of it called A Briefer History of Time. Uh, so I bought that one, and it happened to be four hours long. So I listened to that over and over and over again while I was painting, trying to come to terms with the um, theories that he was talking about. Uh, and I, st I don't know if I, I, probably 30 times I've listened to it and maybe I could talk a bit to it, but I still don't understand half of it. But it's so fascinating is listening to how this guy's brain worked while I'm painting. So does that influence your work at all? Um, I believe so. Yeah. It's, you know, um, I think, I think we're the sum of all of our parts. So anything that you experience in your life, no matter what you, no matter what you do, it's going to reflect uh, uh, and in fact, what it is that you create. So, yes. Well, that's cool because your paintings are almost like all these pieces put together. Exactly, yeah. Wow. So I just did a big uh, commission for Microsoft in Edmonton, and there is a, um, a 30 foot by 10 foot giant children's puzzle with the, this work in, in the offices of Microsoft. Yeah. How cool was that making? It was pretty cool. It was a lot of work because it was also, um, I, I, it was, I pitched the idea and I got it, you know, cause I got a call from them saying, we'd like you to submit. And I'm like, okay, great. So I did it, uh, not knowing if I would get it. And then I got it. I'm like, oh man, I got to figure out how to build this thing. So ended up figuring out how to do all of that. Um, and so it was pretty awesome, but also see, again, seeing the work at that scale, that's probably the biggest single piece that I've ever done. That's all one piece you know 10 feet by 30 feet um but uh massive. it's massive yeah and the thing the the tragedy is is it's and well no a it's amazing that it happened but the tragedy is it's a small office or at least they only have about 12 people in the office so there's very few people that actually see this thing it's for like four engineers in the engineering department <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah yeah so would you ever do something like that again 
Yeah, we've been toying with the idea about doing it again. Um, it's just finding the right place to do it. Um, whether I do it in the gallery in Canmore, where I've got a, some big walls, uh, potentially. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to be... Um, to have a lot going on right now, so having the time to just play with those larger scale conceptual projects are a little bit harder to do right now. You really have like no glass ceiling. You just <laughs> yeah, well, I think for me, um, I, always, I always approach everything in my life from a place of yes, so that um, A, it's hard to say no, <laughs> but also, um, I always find that whenever a project presents itself, you can learn from it and grow from it. So, uh, and the challenges that present itself themselves during the process, you learn and grow from. So you know, there's never a bad project. There's never a bad you know, uh, um, uh, experience. It's just about learning from that and growing. So um, therefore, uh, you know, I, I say yes to a lot of things when people reach out and say, you know, even doing public art, you know, that wasn't my plan to do public art. But when someone reaches out and says, do you want to try it? Like, yeah, I do. Let's see what happens. So graphic designing, sculpting, broadcasting, like the cameraman, painting. What else is there? Well, I, I did have my own company as a high rise window washer for two years when I was in Edmonton, worked my way through college that way, paying for uh, school by cleaning windows on high rises in downtown Edmonton. That's hardcore. <laughs> yeah. And I'm afraid of heights. So <laughs> you, you know, pick that. <laughs> that uh, there you go. So yeah, but that was, that was a long time ago. Do you have advice for those who struggle with glass ceilings, especially artists? Um, I do, yeah. So, you know, for me, I think it comes down to your first introduction or your second introduction or at the very least what you're, what, what you, how you plan on presenting yourself. So for me, I was given an opportunity um, to showcase my work in a gallery setting. Um, and I, and I jumped at the opportunity and threw myself at it and worked for hundreds and hundreds of hours to do that and get it done. And then, uh, and then was asked to, uh, if I wanted to work with another artist to do paintings around the whole space. And I said, you know what? No, I want to paint as well. So I painted versions of my sculptures on solid color canvas. And that's where the whole style evolved from. I was sculpt sculpting first, and then I painted versions of my sculptures on solid colors. And that's where the whole thing started. So it's a completely unique design that I created myself. Um, but I only say that because when I had my very first show, um, I happened to be, uh, my, my partner Bridget was as a theater artist. And the way theater artists work is you, is you book a show, you plan it, and then you do the work, right? And so that's exactly what I did at that moment is I, I booked it, I made 5,000 postcards, invited everybody that I knew to this show that I had zero artwork for. Everybody, right? And so then once I'm like, okay, well, okay, now I've got, I booked it far enough out and I'm like, okay, well, I've got six months to do all the work. Okay, it's busy. So I've naturally procrastinated for three months. And <laughs> so I ended up doing all of this work in three months. I'm like, okay, well, now I'm officially, if I don't start now, I'm not going to get it done. So I'm deadline oriented. So I did all of that. And then also because realizing that I was putting everything out there on the line, um, and inviting everybody I knew, I, and the beauty of it is, because it was my very first show, because I invited everybody I knew, and everybody would come out and support me, I, that's what I would recommend any artist to do. If you're gonna have your very first show, or your, a show, do it, go big, create as much work as you can so you're ready for it, uh, and then hire a professional photographer, hire, don't get your friend, hire a professional photographer for 500 bucks, I know it's a lot of money, but I got to come out and photograph the whole thing. So at the very end of it, you don't, even if you don't sell a single piece, which I guarantee you, you will, because all your friends and family are there and they're going to want to support. So A, you're going to sell work. B, you're going to have great photos of your very first exhibit that you can then use to apply for grants and put on your website. And then you have all of that. And that's your kickstart to your career. Wow. You really went sink or swim. Sink or swim. 
Wow. <laughs> so at mine, we hired a, 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 we also hired a three-piece band to play, right? So you came in and it was like, it, you know, we built these plants. Like I, and the beauty of it as well for me is I, I was coming at it from a point where I was already working full-time as a camera operator for, you know, for six years up to this point. So coming into it, I wasn't like I, stripping and saving. I had already been carving and painting for five, or no, carving for five years before that. And every time I sold a piece, I just reinvested because I, I didn't need to pay rent. I was like, okay, great, I can buy more stone. Great, I can buy tools. So I did that and constantly invested in it. So when I did that first exhibit, I was able to spend the money and invest in it, knowing, not knowing whether I would sell anything. So that's what I would also recommend. So yeah, do go big and do it, but also you got to figure out how to pay your bills, pay your rent, do all of that, do the job that you don't necessarily love, but it'll get you to the point where you are in a position where you can go all in. That must have been so stressful. Three months to do all those pay. I was, I was like, that's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So, and then the, um, the show went very well. I sold, sold out the, um, the sculptures and the paintings. The only ones that didn't sell are the ones I kept for myself. So there was uh, three sculptures in there that I kept. Uh, and, uh, and I kept, you know what, actually, I only kept one painting. Everything else found a home. Uh, uh, it was a big, it was a, it was a giant piece that didn't sell. It is what it is. But now I've got it in long-term storage. So one of these days, I'll bring it out my very first show. So uh, what we're looking at here is um, G. Clay prints. So these are limited edition prints of existing paintings. So there's, uh, you know, this is number nine of 20 of them, and I'll only ever make 20 of this design. Uh, same with this one. These are an open edition, smaller scale prints that I make in-house, uh, which um, really just enable me to revisit older designs and works and be able to offer something at a reasonable price. Because if I was to try and paint these that small, it would be, there's no way I could operate two galleries and all that with trying to paint these little paintings. So these are prints uh, as well. And then these are some children's books that we've done as well. Uh, we're working on, so Who is Boo 1 we did in uh, 2009, something like that. Uh, and then Who is Boo 2, Who is Boo 3. Uh, every few years we did one and we're overdue. We've been talking about Who's Before. We're going to do that this fall. That's the plan anyways. Um, so we'll do Who's Before uh, and, uh, and then, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of other children's books we've been talking about doing, um, which I think it's just about playing, that sense of play, storytelling. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so th those are the children's books. And then this is some smaller cards and, uh, um, and some paper prints as well. Who is Boo? Uh, Boo is a, um, a story about a trickster rabbit. So uh, both Bridget and I uh, both come from um, backgrounds where there are trickster tales. So my, of myself, I'm an indigenous artist, and Bridget is, a, um, is Irish. So there's very strong storytelling, like leprechauns, you know, the trickster leprechauns. So you've got these, this, this we, we wanted to do an exploration of what it is to be a trickster. Um, but a trickster for good as, not, as opposed to evil, right? And so it's about this story about Boo and his brother who are in a race around the world. And in this race around the world, they meet and help other animals along the way. And so it's a way for me to explore these different landscapes and also different animals uh, and also teach lessons of morality at the same time. So we've done Who is Boo One is essentially a Canadian bestseller but you only have to do, you only have to sell 5,000 copies to be a Canadian bestseller. Um, but we've self-published them, so we don't, we've never actually tracked it. Uh, so anyways, that's a long story. So uh, anyways, this is the, in its third print. Yeah, we reprinted in 2021. So we did it in 2011, had our second run in 2014, and this is the third run, 2021. Um, and so we're, we're very excited about who was before. So we're thinking I might, in who was before, he might meet a bison and a bighorn sheep. But in Who is Boo 1, it's wolf and bear. Who is Boo 2, randomly a spider monkey and a prairie dog. And then Who is Boo 3 is a moose and a hawk owl. And so it's just about like, well, you know, let's just tell a story. Let's create something fun. Uh, and so that's, that's where that comes from. How have those been received? 
Very well, yeah, yeah. And that's the, the beautiful, th beautiful thing about who is Boo is we did that in 2011, and that really was the impetus for everything that kind of grew for me as an artist. So um, as I was saying, or I don't know if I said this specifically, but when one is given an opportunity, one needs to jump at it, whether it's creating content for TELUS or it's um, having an opportunity to showcase my artwork in a Royal Alberta Museum. So that's where Who Is Boo came from. The Royal Alberta Museum asked me to do an exhibit in their lobby and they said you can put whatever you want in there. And so we took that as an opportunity to release our first children's book in a museum. So they didn't know we were doing this. We just did it. So then we brought them all in and I'm like, oh yeah, we've got these books. They're like, great. You know, and so that's what happened. We were able to create this. And so I have all those original paintings still from Who's Boo One in storage. Um, and um, we, we printed that first book. Wow. Oh. That's a great way to yeah. be like, Camor and Banff are so family oriented too. Yeah, totally. So kids yeah. Come in. Yeah, for the longest time in the Banff Gallery, or sorry, in the Camor Gallery, there was the whole book series was up. You could come in and walk around and see all of the paintings and, the, and read the story for years and years and years. Just in the last two years, we took it down. Uh, but with Who Is Before and this new the theater space, we're going to do the same thing, but bigger and better. So um, about um, maybe 2013, we did an exhibit for the Royal Alberta Museum. Uh, they asked us to do the children's gallery, where, which we did, and we did the world of Boo. And we explored a three-dimensional version of the book in the gallery. And so we're going to do the same thing in Canmore now, but for us instead of for the Royal Alberta Museum, with Who Is Before. That's the plan anyways, in what this new space. What was that like? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was pretty great. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was the first time we'd ever done anything like that. So we, A, we made it bomb-proof. We went way over budget, lost our shirts. But it was so much fun to do, and the experience was great. Uh, and we learned a lot from losing the money that we did. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when you're given a budget, one needs to remember that you need to be paid as well out of this budget, right? And so we, like, instead we spent all the budget. We're like, oh, right, we're supposed to pay ourselves. Dang it. Right? And we went over budget, too. So that is what it is. How did the, the kids receive it? Um, it was very well received. Yeah, but we heard from uh, the, um, some of the gallery um, uh, curators that it was one of their best uh, received shows in the Children's Museum or um, gallery at the Royal, the Art Gallery of Alberta. Yeah. So like having that impact on the next generation. Yeah, it's pretty cool, especially um, now we've got kids that have been coming in, that come into the gallery and like, where's, who is before, who is before? Like, and it's amazing seeing little humans come in and they're like, mom, mom, it's who is boo, it's who is boo. And they run over and look at the, you know, it just, it blows my mind, you know? And then the, it, it happened to Bridget the other day. There was a little boy that came in and was like, when is who is before coming out? And Bridget said, this fall. And she's like, you said that last year. So this kid has been coming back. And as I said, we've been meaning to do Who's Before for years now. So that's what we tell everybody. Oh, yeah, this Christmas, it's coming for sure. And life happens and you don't get it done. Uh, so, you know. But we've set a deadline this time, which is why Who's Before is happening for Christmas. 2024. That's exciting. No, 2023. 2023. What year is it? 2023. <laughs> that little girl was pretty pissed. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> totally. That's so cool. Children's books. That's yeah. Amazing. We've got lots of ideas of the children's books that we want to do that we've been talking about. And uh, this is just a smaller continuation of the space. So uh, variations and sizes of the Giclés. Uh, and then this is a really big piece that I'm very excited about. It just sold. It's going to Whistler. Um, yeah. And it's uh, two bears looking off into the distance of uh, Mount Assiniboine. Oh. Are bears some of your favorite to portray? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, bears and rabbits. So I love to carve rabbits and I love to paint bears and carved bears. Uh, um, but yeah, it's definitely a, pro, uh, a topic that I, uh, I, I like to revisit and explore um, within the landscapes, um, creating these animals that, um, you know, the natural history of Canada, sort of exploring um, Canada and the natural environment through an indigenous lens, especially 
uh, within landscape painting. Um, you know, because when, now when you hear landscape painting, Canadian landscape painting, you think Group of Seven, right? And it's through this European lens. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is re-examine it through an indigenous lens, hence the bright, bold colors, the thick black lines, and just trying to um, reclaim it in a way. That's so true. Indigenous art is always so much more colorful. Hey? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, when I first started painting, I was looking at a lot of uh, Norville Morriso uh, and uh, Andy Warhol, uh, and then an artist from the States uh, by the name of uh, Charlie Harper. Uh, Charlie Harper does these amazing um, animal paintings, or did these amazing animal paintings um, that were very like a bird with like four shapes, you know, or a ladybug with just a circle and four circles. You know, very abstract, but you, as soon as you look at it, you know what it is. Right? And so that's kind of the, you put those three artists together and that's me. If you could, well, I guess you just described it in one sentence. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask. But you... Yeah, well, it's not, it's like, I wouldn't say that the work is, it's such a tricky question, but well, how does one describe one's work? Because it's uniquely my own and I developed it myself, so is it, uh, you know, contemporary, um, indigenous, woodlands, pop art. I don't know. I make it that's something every time. So, but it is, you know, what is it? You know, in a sentence, it's what I love to do. Is there a favorite collaboration you have with another artist? Um, well, you know, as I said before, it really comes down to the most recent one. So right now I just finished doing a collaboration with two other artists, Don Marie Marchand out of Edmonton uh, and Keegan Starlight from uh, Tsitsina. Uh, and we all painted a bison, and it's over on the, um, in the Art and Nature Trail here in Banff. So in that, we all took our own, because we're all from different treaties, treaties six, seven, and eight, uh, and uh, we're able to explore what the bison meant to us in the national park, especially with the reintroduction of the bison into the park. They're doing really well. Uh, and it's such a historically meaningful animal. I think for all of us, it was pretty cool to work on it uh, together. It was a very spiritual uh, uh, relationship and connection that the three of us were able to, to share. So, and you can see it now, it's, on, it's open until September. Literally, end of, end of Banff, uh, Banff Ave, before you cross over, there's a Banff Museum there. Right behind it, there's a tree, set of trees, and there's three bison tied to this tree. And that's where it is. There's a land acknowledgement. One of the first land acknowledgements as well that have been in, um, uh, what's it called? Um, in Banff uh, for a long time, which is pretty cool. There have been a lot of struggles with that kind of stuff in Banff, hey? Yeah, yeah. So did you each individually do a uh, bison or collaborate on all three of the bison? Uh, we each did an individual bison. So it's a collaborative project where we each brought our own. So they're all three of them are completely different. That is wicked. Yeah. Before, <laughs> there you go. How about we just kind of set up here? Um, would you be more comfortable? How has your culture impacted your creative journey? Well, being a Cree artist, one has no choice but to be influenced by their, my culture, their culture, uh, um, when it comes to artwork. So, uh, you know, the bright, bold colors, uh, you know, the Woodlands Cree um, uh, um, uh, style of creation, like Norville Moore. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's the beauty of being able to explore my culture with color and line and story. So, yeah, it, it definitely influences my work. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see your work? Um, you know, I hope that they would be proud. I hope that they would, uh, that it would put smiles on their faces uh, and that they would, um, that they are uh, excited to see, to see the work being showcased uh, in, you know, um, in such a, uh, a beautiful way, in a great environment, in a national park, in their national park, you know, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I hope that they're dancing in the sky. You are trailblazing though. That's crazy representation, what you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, you know, being, um, uh, well, the only indigenous 
specifically Indigenous gallery in Canmore and in Banff uh, is, you know, is uh, pretty cool. I think that it's, you know, it's an opportunity for me to share the work uh, and uh, share my culture at the same time. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be able to do it. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of people that are interested in the work. And uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a good place to be for sure. Has it been received well? It has been, yeah. And um, the beauty of uh, Canmore and Banff is it's international audiences. So they're coming from all over the world, landing at the Calgary International Airport and then coming to the mountains. You know, so I'm able to therefore um, ship work to the U.S., ship work to Europe. And it goes, it's, it's gone global, you know, to Thailand, to Singapore, to all over the place. So the, this, you know, snapshot, these renditions of my interpretation of the Canadian Rockies is, you know, now therefore expanding and growing outside of the borders of Canada as well. So it's, it's pretty cool. Wow. I bet you've heard some cool stories too. Yeah, it's great. And people come in and exactly. And it's, you know, I'm fortunate in the sense that uh, my partner and I worked in television for a long time and uh, on a morning show. Uh, and so it was uh, like, for lack of a better description, like hosting a little party every morning with people who were excited to show us what it is that they're doing or promote what it is that they were doing. So um, we kind of have taken that, um, those experiences and brought them into the gallery where we are then, someone's coming in from the US uh, or from Germany and we're able to have a great connection, conversation, show them the work, but also showcase the town. Uh, so, you know, getting to meet these people from all over the place uh, is, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of different stories and people coming from different places and walks of life. And so, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot for sure. Do you have any advice for artists who are looking to get into the gallery scene? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, as I said before, um, having your very first exhibit is important, an important step. So for a lot of gallerists, they want to see proof of concept, know that you've done it, know that you're committed, know you're going to do it. So that's one way to do it, is to have your own show. And that could be as simple as renting a hall near your home and doing the show there. It's just getting whatever opportunity that you can to showcase the work uh, and then get photos, but also creating the work. It's about consistently investing in your craft. And then if you do that and you have enough work, so when you bring in your portfolio to show to a gallerist, and they say, oh, this is great. Do you have anything else? You can say, yes, I do, right here. And you can show them all the work that you've been doing. So they know that you're committed, know that if they say, okay, well, we'll take four pieces and then miracles upon miracles they've sold, and they call and say, I need four more. You're not like, oh yeah, I'll get them to you in eight months when I'm finished. You're like, no, here's four more, I'll bring them over, right? So it's just being ready for it, I think is the most important. Awesome. Who have been your biggest supporters through your creative journey? Um, my cr biggest supporters are obviously my partner, Bridget. Uh, my mom and my family, but also my friends and my um, community uh, have been tremendous supporters of, of, of my work uh, and helping me get to where I am today. So yeah, it's, it's important to have a good network around you in order to make it happy to constantly also, you know, nudge you as well when you start to feel low or down or whatever, like, oh, this is too hard. You need someone else to be like, no, just keep going. So yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. What do you hope people learn or take away from viewing your gallery and your pieces? Um, well, I, um, I hope that when people come into the gallery and see the work, that they're inspired and that they smile. It's about, uh, for me, capturing a moment, capturing a time, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and a landscape all in one that is warm and positive. And so I hope that when they come in, they feel that warmth uh, and that when they leave, they can't get it out of their heads. What has been your biggest lesson through your creative journey? My biggest lesson through my creative journey to now has been commitment, working 
pursuing as cheesy as it sounds, pursuing your dreams and you know, never work a day in your life. So just commitment is what it comes down to, I think. Now, two more questions. Uh, how do you see yourself growing as an artist? Well, um, I see myself growing as an artist incrementally slowly for the next 35 years. So that, so that Jason now looks at work in 30 years and is like, damn, that looks good. That's what I hope.